Good morning, everyone. Give me a second. I've got a new mic. Hopefully, this should help with any audio issues we were having before. I'm just going to test it out to make sure I can hear you guys and you can hear me. Hmm. All right, microphone is recording. Looks like I can. I see the bars going up and down, so it means it's working. And the speakers should just be hooked up to my computer speakers. I don't hear them though. Let's test these speakers out so I know that you can hear me and I know there's no issues. Nothing from those, nothing from those. That's the one. Okay. All right, so that should be good. Now let me just do a little bit of testing with the mic. You might hear double audio for a second. Perfect. Okay. Sorry for the annoyance. That should do it. Let's see, that should mean that the stream is live. Mariam Shahar Fian. Hi. Happy New Year to you as well. Let's see. Zasenaru Kitsune. What's up, ma'am? Okay. Good. I am live here on ZBrush again. Uh, the final stream of 2018. Thanks for joining who all are here and who all will be joining or watching this later. Let me hide this OBS out of the way. Let me shrink this window down. And yeah, as you can see, I'm watching myself on Facebook. <laughs> and also on not that one, on Twitch. So if you guys have any questions, just drop them in the chat room, and I'll try to get to them as soon as I can, or just in the comments. I'm trying to uh, be up on that. Aside from that, um, where should I begin? I'll do the usual quick intro. My name is Eamon Akhtar. I'm a 3D artist in Los Angeles. Uh, over the past four years, I've been doing a lot of 3D print-related projects, as you can see here. Um, Large-scale projects with Lion Studio, Steve Wang and all, uh, my own company, 3D Smiths, uh, stop motion animation with Stupid Buddy, random costuming stuff I like to make. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff that I've been up to. Uh, the past almost seven months I was working at uh, Hero Forge making little miniatures for Dungeons and & Dragons. And over the past two years I've been developing my own toy line, Fungosaurs, little dinosaur mushroom hybrids. And we did this via Kickstarter, my wife and I, and we've now finally launched it. So if you go to fungusstores.com, There's our baby. You can go to the store and then buy them as mystery box toys, learn all about them, and then just follow us on Instagram. See, we're all, we've been traveling with them. Currently trying to develop Fungusaurs as an IP for an animation pitch. Also, uh, the toy line is out now, so trying to expand that into plush and other kinds of uh, toy avenues. Um, and Primarily, though, uh, working on an augmented reality game to bring the toys to life. So that's where uh, we're at with things. And quick primer of what I've been up to. <coughs> I've been streaming for ZBrush Live for a little bit now. If you just Google ZBrush Live, and you go down to the presenters here. A lot of awesome artists. Shane Olson will be presenting later today, I think. Actually, let me double check that before I say it, because it's New Year's Eve. Yeah, he's not presenting today. Only I'm crazy enough to present today. <laughs> well, you can come down to my name, check out the past broadcast and schedule, and you'll see I'm up for January 7th, 14th, 28th. And you can check out all the previous streams. So there's some of my work here, like this 3D printed dress I did for 3D World magazine a while back. Actually, you can see that dress right there. Now it's become a really nice lamp in my room. And if you take a look 
in what's happening in my room. I've decked it out a little bit more since I had some time on my hands. Um, and I had to get a few more printers for a gig. So now I've got these guys. Uh, probably not going to last. I'm going to give them back to my friends because I just borrowed them for, you know, basically this rush crazy job that came in, which I can't talk about. But I want to do this. I want to get a couple more of these bad boys because these Form Labs Form 2s, solid. Uh, they're about 3,000, 3,500 range. Same with the one down there, the Race 3D N2 Plus. Also a pretty solid, you know, prosumer level desktop printer, uh, about 3,500 or so. FDM printing there, uh, SLA printing here. I can go into detail again about what that means. If you're interested, uh, just type it in the comments. But I'm excited to see my room start coming together. You know, it's been a long time coming. Boot. Yeah. This is basically what I do with my business, 3D Smiths. I help people bring their 2D ideas to life as 3D sculptures. So basically your standard look development, but the output is 3D print. Um, yeah, so basically for the past four months, I'm saying basically too much. Over the past four months, I've been doing a lot of the same projects. Since September, I tried to do primarily on my stream the same project from start to finish so you guys could see how I go about very, very early blocking in of a character, defining the hair, defining clothing, defining metal pieces and straps and the backpack, um, adding rocks and environment, and basically getting it all said basically again. <laughs> getting it all ready for the final push, which is today. I'm going to try to wrap up Ryan Winch's uh, Space Pilgrim character here. And from there, I'm going to be a bit more pensive and talk about what New Year's Eve means to me, what uh, I, I, got, I feel like I accomplished in 2018, and what I want to accomplish in 2019, hopefully. So that's kind of what today's going to be. Just going to be streaming for a couple of hours, uh, going to wrap up the... Space Pilgrim project, hopefully send it to print right now, and then we'll move on to a little bit of uh, career talk, life talk, something like that. I feel like motivational speaking has become a hobby of mine now. All right, so check in if you guys. Darlan Jimenez Dos Santos, what's up, man? Thanks for joining. <laughs> Glad you like it. All right, Twitch. We got pass Padges Core. Cool, cool. All right, so good, 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 good. Here's the language Logan project. I'm gonna open it up in ZBrush, and let's just jump right in. That's kind of what the ZBrush live stream has meant to me over the past, uh, I don't know, half a year. I started doing this with ZBrush. Uh, it basically is a chance for me to work on the things I want to work on just without any distractions. Monday morning, come in and do the thing I want to do first and then do client stuff for the rest of the week. <laughs> All right, so as you can see with this character, we've got it pretty well defined. I'm going to end up merging some pieces still, such as this shirt and the arm. You can see a bunch of those are still separate pieces. But basically, outside of just refinements, I've got the character almost done sculpting to the point where I'm happy with him. And I know he's going to look good in print at about a 4-inch scale print. Rocks on the base. Did this using insert mesh brushes, where we quickly mocked up one, or maybe I think four different types of rocks, and then just drew them out all over the place duplicated that chunk, moved it all around, and settled it down. Very quick way to achieve a very nice rocky effect. The hair was earlier done with simple mesh extraction followed by uh, dam standard to define the creases and a little bit of clay buildup to define the chunks and then going over it with the Dylan Ekron hair tubes brush which is a really great way to add all these strands and quickly add detail. Kind of like that rainbow color look on them. Thinking about 3D prints, I'm not leaving any ledges or any hollow spaces. Uh, even the eyelashes you can see, or eyelids, I've kind of got them extruding pretty far out so that when they print, you'll actually be able to see those. 
the mouth there isn't much of a cavity it's pretty much just this behind the teeth I'm gonna make sure those teeth are back in there looks like I should divide these ears subtle things like that but the main thing I wanted to do to tie this project up is add Ryan's Space Pilgrim logo over here and then send it to print so let's actually jump out of ZBrush quickly and go into Photoshop we're going to open up ah. by the way did anyone see the Bumblebee movie yet I've had it up as my desktop for a few weeks now, but I haven't gotten the chance. I think it just came out last week, and I was traveling all last week. Kurt Boutillier, good morning, man. Thanks for joining. All right, Patch Score is asking, do you recommend this printer for personal use? Um, the Form 2? Absolutely. Um, it takes a bit of getting used to, uh, learning how to orient things properly, support them for SLA printing in general. Um, I teach a course on that on Mold 3D Academy. If you guys are interested in learning about 3D printing basics, uh, you can go to mold3dacademy.com. The winter term is just about to begin, January 2nd. And my class should be under self-paced, 3D printing for ZBrush artists. So you get to learn all about different types of 3D printing, eight different uh, lessons, pretty good price right now, 200 bucks. Uh, because you're getting eight weeks worth of lessons. You can check out the lesson plan here and you can check out the student gallery. Alright, I'll drop that link in the comments. Alright, good. Zenaru Kitsune says Bumblebee is amazing. Good to hear. I'm looking forward to seeing it because a lot of people have told me it's like my one of my favorite films, The Iron Giant. Brad Bird's, I'd say, masterpiece of 2D animation. I think it's mostly not about the animation, though. It's about the relationship between the girl and the giant robot. And basically being able to develop that strong bond. That's what will make the movie successful to me or not. All right. Uh, all right. So Zanara is also asking about... This isn't 3D print related, but any chance you could go over fiber mesh in depth? Uh, probably not today, because fiber mesh is too complex of a topic to break down in a short time, and I kind of have a set schedule. Uh, but I'll try to maybe do a quick primer on fiber mesh. Maybe I'll add some grass to this scene. All right, so I'm going to go to Open in Photoshop, Downloads folder. And got this GIF. This logo from Ryan. I'm going to duplicate that. Whoop. It's not letting me do that. Why? Let me see. Image mode. Yeah, it's index color. So I'm going to switch that first to RGB. Now I should be able to work it. Good. Let's throw in just a simple white background so we can see what's happening fully white is white and I'm going to desaturate this because we're trying to create an image for ZBrush to use and so I'm going to adjust it a little bit and crank the levels now if I crank them too much I lose that little bit that I like or maybe we can come back to that because I think it's important to crank this just so I can see the separation of a few different elements and I'll come in here grab this little streak rocket streak this might not read when we end up taking it to 3D anyway because Ryan's got a lot of awesome color stuff going on here and we just need it to actually show up. I'm going to pop up a new layer and do a fill with just black and foreground color. That way at least we see it. 
Now, it looks a bit tiny to me, um, and when the logo is going to be shrunk down to be put on the base, it's going to get about that small. So we won't really get a sense of that little loop. Um, one thing I could try is going to my select and adjusting this mask by growing it. So I'm going to go to select, modify, and expand. And let's just do five pixels and do another fill. So it makes it a bit thicker, but the good thing is I think it just reads a little bit better. And come in here just with my regular brush. Opacity cranked up. Try to fix some of this. Can even erase some other stuff. Again, opacity cranked. Same thing on the other end. Whoa. All right, trying to thicken up that black outline a little bit. Because again, same issue. Once it's really tiny, I don't think it'll read. So whereas this kind of reads really well in color on his print photograph, I want to turn it into something like this so that we can drag it out as an alpha mask and it actually still shows up. We may want to also... Let's see if I can select it from here. Yep, yeah, it's black. I should be able to. Grab that outer edge. Again, do select, modify, expand, five pixels, and drop in black. All right, looking pretty clean. Little chunk sticking out there. And if I want, I should go in and really fix all this rasterization, but I'm not too worried because I have a feeling that once I do drag out the alpha and smooth it out, I won't see a lot of that. Can try to do a bit of basic cleanup. All right, so that I think should work pretty well. Let's give it a shot because there is still black, gray, and white happening here. And I may want to take this gray, just tone it down a bit. Let's make it non contiguous. There we go. Mm, let's go with like a little bit darker than that. Perfect. All right, I'm going to turn this also into a square. So I'll go to image canvas size. It's like it's about 3,000 by 3,000. Now I think that should work. So let's try to save it out as a PNG or a TIFF or really any a JPEG would work fine too. Let's try TIFF first. Onto the desktop as Space Program logo. Let's try one or BW1 for black and white. No image compression. Where's the layers? I want to turn the layers off. Discard layers. Okay. All right, so I'm going to go now back in ZBrush, go to my Texture tab, and try to import that image. Let's 
Space Program logo, BW1, open that up. And there's our logo in ZBrush now. Now you'll notice it turned the black into kind of just negative space. Um, shouldn't make too much of a difference because we're going to flip this logo, I think, horizontally and then click on Make Alpha. Turn it off in the Texture tab and when it's in this alpha state, it'll go back to being black. Now I don't want it in the Move brush, I want it in my Standard brush. <coughs> Excuse me. So you're going to go to Drag Rectangle, Standard, and select that new alpha we just made. Let's also go over to the base solo that base so we can see just that. Scene's getting a bit heavy. We've got about 26, no, almost, let's see, unsolo this. Yeah, 26.7 million polys in the scene. And we're going to basically try to throw this uh, logo right here. So let's see what happens with Z add, Z intensity of 25, the logo just as is. I'm going to try to take the focal shift down, or let me show you first what happens at zero focal shift. So the focal shift basically sets it up so that the edges are a bit bl more blurry than the front. So I'm going to have to kill the focal shift down to negative 100 and now the logo comes out just fully as one piece. Now the direction that I drag it affects how it comes out onto the surface. So there's one part. And if I switch it to Z-Sub and drag it upwards, now we're starting to get something in the direction we want. Polygon count is still too low, and when the logo is this small, it basically just rasterizes like crazy. Also, the white really has a big impact on the way the logo is dropped in. So let me try something. I'm going to try to invert this alpha. Inverse. And now let's try it again. And now we've got just the logo. So that's what we want, basically. And let's try to figure out how we can get it so that it shows up clean. I'm going to pull up uh, Ryan's reference so I can remember how he actually envisioned that on there. Alright, so he didn't even really think about this little curve thing. He basically wants the logo to be as big as possible, which is good for us, because that means there will be even less uh, rasterization. And he wanted the by Ryan winch off of the corner. Alright, so I'm going to have to go back into the Photoshop file and get rid of Ryan winch over there, just make it Space Pilgrim. So let's do that. We'll export it back out. Uh oh. What? Oh, contiguous. All right, like that first. BW2. I wish it would just save the settings from the previous export. Software does not think for you. You always have to think for it. Alright, here's the logo 2. I'm going to open that up. Same thing as before. I know that it's better to flip it horizontally in order for me to drag it out the way I want. So I'm going to select it and I'll flip it horizontally, inverse it, and then click Make Alpha. So it's already there the way I want it, and let's try drawing it out again. Now we may have to do some creative masking in order to get this to work properly, but let me show you what happens when I just draw it out. And we try to make it big. So it affects parts of the mesh that we don't want it affected. Below, above, probably in the back too somewhere. No, primarily just in the front. But still, that's affecting areas we don't want it to affect. So we should fix that. 
easy way to fix that is to just mask it off. Mask off the area that we want to have it draw out. Mask that part. Come around to here. Unmask that part. I'm going to go to the top. Let's unselect that area. Now, if we want to be really perfect about this, there is a mask circle that we could try to draw out. Try to get that just a little bit better. All right. And we can come in and refine that mask as well. Since this will be bleeding up over the top, I'm going to make sure I get the mask as nice as I can. Definitely looking forward to seeing the Bumblebee movie. Already saw Aquaman. Had to, considering I became Aquaman earlier this year, <laughs> just for fun. Right, that should work pretty well for the top. Let's look at the bottom. All right, so at the bottom, we've still got a lot of negative space here that is affected but we can just go off to the side select the mask rectangular and then unselect the bottom now I'll invert my mask try to maybe also invert that area one cool trick I learned is you can hold space and then just move your entire mask around that's pretty useful for masking. Got that crevice. Do the same thing here. And then we're almost done with our mask. All right, cool. So now we got it. We could try drawing it out again. Now that we've got the area masked off that we don't want. However, you'll notice if I draw it out just as is, the curve tends to go upward. It bows up. Why is it doing that? Well, it's doing that because we, our scene is a bit tilted. Our canvas, I guess. So it's trying to do it against the normals of the scene rather than the normals of the ZBrush front space. Now, there's a few different ways we can approach this. We can try to draw it somewhere in the front here. where it isn't facing the back and I think that'll probably be the best move or we could try to Z project which is a whole nother thing but you can see when we take a look from the side it's doing something like that now I think the logo is fine it just needs to be a bit more uh, it, we need to play with the intensity to figure out what the best intensity for this is going to be take it down a bit because don't want to be too much and I'll try to come up to the very top of this as I can and then draw it out. That one was still facing up a bit. There we go. And that should do the trick. I'm going to drop it and I'm going to come in and Dynamesh and do a little bit of cleanup again. So Dynamesh at 500 resolution was what it was set to. Let's try that and see what happens. Meanwhile, I can check out your questions. <laughs> Alright, now you're talking about Iron Giant, which is highly recommended to watch that again. I just watched it this past month. Um, 
Bumblebee was an amazing film, I guess you're saying. Aquaman, not so much. <laughs> I'd have to agree with you a bit. Uh, DC does comics amazingly. Uh, they kind of tend to drop the ball with movies, and I don't know why that is. I think that Aquaman, I think Jason Momoa tried to make a much more badass version of Aquaman, which was cool. Um, but Zack Snyder just is so action-oriented, the director, that uh, I, I feel like the whole universe he's set up, all of this stuff is just constant action, a lot of convenient explosions to move the plot forward. They don't get enough time for character development and storytelling. Uh, Jason Momoa's character starts out badass, and he's a reluctant badass, and by the end of it, he's a badass that is dedicated to, you know, his goal. But there's not much character development from my point of view. Okay, cool. Dynamesh is complete. Now it lowered it down from 5 million to 1.3 million and kind of janked up our mesh a lot more. So we don't want that. Let's try 1000 resolution. Make sure project is off. Try again. Alright, Raython Studios is saying, uh, suggesting another method. Instead of doing it as an alpha, could you not create an IMM brush with the projection strength in the brush setting set to 100? That's a good idea. Let's try that. There's a hundred ways in ZBrush to do any one thing. The alpha seems to be the most direct, but it requires cleanup. So let's try doing it as an IMM brush, and that way there's no cleanup required in theory. It should just draw out, and then you can even rotate it. Always drown to try different suggestions, different ways of doing the same thing. But maybe the results will be better and I won't have to do some cleanup. Alright, so this is better. We got about 5 million polys. And if I smooth it out, we start getting the imprint of the logo, which is really all I'm going for. I'm not going for anything like super perfect because I know when it prints, once I do the isopropyl bath, once I UV cure it and sand the heck out of it, uh, you lose always a bit of detail. going to smooth out that edge a little bit more. But this is what I mean about it needing cleanup. When you're working with non-rasterized, non-vector images, trying to do this specific workflow, leaves a little bit something to be desired. But it gives us the imprint, which gives us, you know, what we're going for. So that's one way. And let me try this way that uh, Rithon Studio suggested. I'm going to duplicate my base, hide it, and then go back and undo history on the other one until hopefully that logo is not there. A lot of smoothing, I guess. There we go. So there's the mast area. This is for shit so I'm gonna keep that mask around switch to my simple brush maybe let's do a plain 3D draw it out standard plain 3D doesn't have a lot of polys it's about a thousand active points uh, we wanna crank this in order to for us to be able to get that uh, logo to show up so I'm gonna turn this into a poly mesh 3D and crank the polys let's see 4 million? Let's try one more time. It should be 16 million or so. Okay. Turn off polyframe and let's go to my standard drag rectangle and drag out the alpha right here. Uh oh. All right, I'm going to try to do a Z add instead of a Z sub. See if it gives us slightly better results. 
And if I do a Z add, I have to invert uh, the alpha again. So I'll do alpha flip horizontal. There we go. Try to make it as big as I can in this thing. All right, so that's coming out pretty clean at that resolution. Could even crank the resolution even higher. <laughs> Rayton Studio is saying save before you crash. That's a good point. I should definitely do that. Save this as Logan 15. So I'd Ryan's folder. All right, so what we can do is basically take it from here and do a Dynamesh. Let's try 128 resolution. Not oh, crud. I have to first get rid of the subdivisions. See if I can back out of this Dynamesh. It might have been a good thing we just saved. And 128 resolution seems to be chugging it as well. You guys might be hearing my voice kind of scatter. as the computer thinks. All right. So 128 resolution is not enough at all. And I think it tried to do it off the lowest subdivision level. So I'm going to undo. Delete lower. Let's try again, just at 128 resolution, just to see what happens. I'm going to try playing some music and see how it goes, picking up through this Rod Lave mic. Let's see, easy press stream. All right, so 128 resolution is still nowhere near enough. Let's crank it. Mm, let's try 2000 first. Trying to wake my body up while Dynamesh does his thing. See what that sounds like on Twitch. All right, so the music doesn't really come out like music to you guys. It's reverbing through the mic, and that doesn't sound too good, so I'm not going to do that. I'll have to figure out a way to be able to play music while I talk just through the computer, not coming through the mic. All right, so this Dynamesh is taking a while at 2000 resolution. But basically the idea is that once it does finish Dynameshing at a good resolution, we could try to delete the background plane, even thicken it a bit more, and then turn that into its own IMM mesh. It requires a little bit more cleanup, but that's one way I thought to have a standalone Space Pilgrim logo that we could then extrude out. If I asked Paul Gabriel, he'd probably come up with like 10 other ways to put a logo on something.
But I'm glad we're trying, but we're trying. It's how we learn. <clears throat> Problem is, the dynamashing just takes forever. Meanwhile, I can send myself something which we can talk about shortly. There's another one. Okay, this is interesting. So Peter Obier Art, Peter Robbie Art, I think, <laughs> uh, is saying on Twitch, if you're an OBS on a Mac, then you can use I show you to handle multiple input devices. Okay, I'm not on a Mac, but I am on OBS. And I do recall there being a way to have multiple input devices in OBS. I'm looking at the sources bar here while Dynamesh is doing its thing. Pretty cool when I show it to you guys because it looks like that infinity mirror window. It's kind of going spiraling into nothingness. But right there, there's my sources. So I should be able to update the sources or maybe add another audio input, a secondary audio input in order for it to have audio direct from the PC as well as from the mic. Our Mr. Animation saying, add an audio output capture. All right, add in that now. Let's see. Right click, add, add audio output capture. Create new, let's call it music so we know what it's referring to. Okay. Device. Let's see, what the hell is the device that it's using right now? For playback, it's using, I think, this NVIDIA High Definition Audio 2757 on my machine. So let's try that one. Okay. Okie dokie. No, wait. That means it's still going to play through there, but let's try. Okay. Alright, so we've got that secondary audio output capture. Alright, so you're saying not to use NVIDIA. It will create feedback echo. Yeah, I, I think so, I agree. But I'm trying to figure out a way there is that I can hear music live while you can also hear it. Alright, hold on. This Dynamesh completed. That looks good. 5 million polys. Pretty clean once we hit it with a quick tap. So I'm going to try something now. I'm going to go to move. Turn off my gizmo for a second. Just tap move on this plain surface. And you can see how thick the logo is right now, the way we've drawn it out. But what I want to do is make it even thicker. So I'm going to drag it and move it forward. And that should just make it overall thicker. I don't know how thick I want to make it, but let's try this much. Alright, so we thickened up that logo, basically making it extrude much further out. And I'm going to go with my select rectangle now and try to basically delete the or hide the back plane. So I'm going to drag a selection over it, just over the back end and then hide that. So that basically does what we hope and hides it and I don't know if it'll work because the Dynamesh might still create some jankiness but let's try deleting hidden so modify topology delete hidden and then we'll do a Dynamesh and hopefully it'll fill the holes just right and we can use it. Alright so Mr. Animation is saying back to this we got a few people helping me out. Great. Okay, so ENGDND says you need another software to divide your audio with virtual audio cable. Then you'll be able to add your, for example, Chrome YouTube audio as audio source. 
and then if I use speakers real tech you can turn the volume down on your desktop but it won't change the volume on your speakers that you hear and you use this while you stream okay thank you mr. animation let's give that a shot so I'll go to my audio output capture adjust that to real tech digital I don't know, speakers real tech, okay. And then let me adjust my own sound here to playback from. Actually, shouldn't matter. I should be able to leave it here, but because you guys are on speakers real tech, you may not hear it. It'll still create feedback though. Trying to avoid that feedback from the music coming through the mic, that's the challenge. Easiest solution, I put on headphones. At least that way, I can hear the music and you can hear the music without feedback. You know what? Come to think of it, I have headphones somewhere. Now I'm addicted to trying to solve this challenge. And Dynamesh is taking its time thinking, so let me try to run over and grab my headphones. I'll be right back, guys. All right. All right, got some headphones. They're a tangled mess, as of course they always are. Got some Bluetooth headphones. And I need to figure out Bluetooth compatibility on this PC as well. They don't use Bluetooth for a lot of things on this thing. Maybe that would solve a few problems in one go. All right, Dynamesh looks like it worked but it also filled in that whole negative space we had which I don't like too much filling so I kinda like what it did in the back there but just closing all of this I guess it'll be fine because the way we're gonna use it the back end is gonna be buried in the, in the logo so shouldn't create too much problem you just using it like this so I'm gonna leave it as it is I'm gonna go to the clip brush clip curve just clip the back end just so it's a bit more sharp and clean. Alright, let's try this thing with the headphones. See if this works. Alright, hold on guys. The mic might lose you for a second, but I'll be back. All right, give me a sec. Let me get set up again. Thank you guys for bearing with me as I figure this out. It'll make a better stream for all of us in the future. All right, so let's see here. Recording, real tech high definition audio, microphone, webcam. Okay, no. So we're using the right mic for hearing things. Let's see what it sounds like. So, sounds right. Cool. So the mic is working. Playback, let's change this to headphones. In this case, I think that's speakers. That worked. Let's try it. Set as default device. 
In this case, I think that's speakers. All right, so good. I can hear through the that headphones works. now. Let's try it. And you guys can hear, set as default device. In this case, I think that's speakers. All right, so good. I can hear through the that headphones works. now. Let's try it. And you guys can hear, set yeah. as default device. Perfect. That worked. Okay, so now I've got audio for me. I've got mic for you. And let's try solving the last problem, which is if I play music, how does it sound to you? <laughs> Mr. Animation saying it's doubled. All right. Peter Robillard says very clear. Tune it down for a second and see what the stream did. All right. Peter Robillard says very clear. All right. Perfect. Figured it out. Y'all. Tune it down for a second and see what the stream did. Perfect. I'm glad we figured that out. So I'll keep the volume relatively low. Kind of have it as background noise while we do our thing. All right, we got Cameron Farn and Stephen Anderson joining on Facebook. Thanks for joining, guys. What's up? Really great folks. I'm glad every time I see them. Every time I see them, probably not often enough as much as I'd like. But Cameron, I was in your neck of the woods, so to speak, this past week. I was in Canada. In uh, Yellowknife. Almost Northwest Yukon Territories. I think it is Northwest Territories. And just this frozen Arctic tundra. It was like negative 30 degrees the entire week I was up there. Freezing, but it was awesome because I got to see a lot of Aurora Borealis. <laughs> Kurt Boutier is saying I'll let him in. <laughs> Thanks for letting me into Canada, yes. Mr. Animation is saying you have great troubleshooting skills to work in Zebra, so it only makes sense that we all try to figure it out. Absolutely. Just 3D in general, you would think that the software makes you faster or better as an artist. It doesn't. It makes it harder. Alright, so now I'm liking the way this logo is looking. I want to do a little bit of smoothing and I want to do a little bit of inflation. So let's try doing an inflate of one. Or let's just dynamesh it again first. Now that I've done that crisp cut around the back, hopefully it won't take too long. Oh yeah, man, I had a great time in Canada. Aside from the Aurora Borealis almost every night up there in Yellowknife, um, we got to do some dog sledding, got to do some cross-country skiing, found a frozen waterfall. Lots of different uh, cold weather science experiments we were trying. <laughs> like, uh, did you know boiling water freezes at a faster temperature than regular, you know, cooled water or chilled water? Um, and I don't know the science behind it or why, but we took a bunch of boiling water in a pan and then threw it above us. And it just evaporates and turns into this mist right away. It's pretty cool. Alright, so that is Dynamesh. Let's go ahead and do a smooth on it quickly. I'm just going over this with a smooth brush. Just holding shift. Like I said, hundreds of different ways to do anything in ZBrush. This way, about 16 million resolutions. Still leaves a little bit of uh, rasterization from the rasterized logo. But I want to try it for a few different reasons. Alright, smoothing's working pretty well on it though.
digging it. Only thing I can think of is that area might give us some problems where it's way too thin. This area is all good, pretty thick. Let's try what happens when I do a little bit of inflation. Too much. I'll try to only inflate the areas I want to inflate by just masking. So I'll make a pretty generous mask selection and then try to unmask the back. These are the kinds of things you have to think about when 3D printing. You have to be a bit of an engineer and think about what stuff is going to look like as a physical object. It's not just good enough to have it uh, look good digitally. It has to function. It has to be balanced. It has to actually exist in the real world. And that area, those letters might be too thin. So again, I'm going to go over to the side and I'm going to unmask the back. That gives us the selection that we want. I'm going to invert that selection and inflate just that. And I can inflate at ease. Too much. That pretty much gives us what we want. And I can try the trim adaptive brush try to flatten the front of those a bit, letters. I don't know if that helps. It's hard not to select other parts. I think it helps. Let's mask that area. Invert the mask and just do it with a big trim adaptive brush now. This should do the trick. Whoa. How strange. It's thinking that there's more going on than there is. That's the problem with Trim Adaptive. It works really well until it doesn't. So I'm just doing some light taps so that Trim Adaptive doesn't get the wrong idea. And perfect. Thickened up those letters. I'm going to do another Dynamesh and just quickly smooth it out and that should be perfect, ready for us to project. It does help to have a giant Cintiq that I can just quickly tap on. Alright, here we go. So we've got a little bit of jankiness happening coming through the back. But I'm not too worried because I'm going to bury, bury, bury all of that back in. Pretty much up till there, I'm going to bury it. So let's see what this looks like once we actually work with it. I'm going to smooth out the edges a bit. Alright, not caring again about the holes. I'm going to frame this in my scene and I will go to brush and say create insert mesh brush new <laughs> Rathon Studios is again reminding me to save good call Alright, with our IMM brush selected now, and this clean base, let's try drawing it out. See what happens. Now I've got Solo turned on, that's why everything got hidden. But basically, it works. It gives us an extruded piece. I'm going to turn Solo off. Actually physically turn off the rest of the stuff in this scene. Yeah, we don't have a lot of extra stuff anyway. Just one extra base. Now I don't need solo and I can actually draw it out. And 
and we can see how it draws out. It draws it right on the surface, but that means we'll see all the holes, and I don't want that. So I'm going to go in and adjust my brush depth. Move this window out of the way. You can see I've got my brush depth set right here. So it was on the surface, I'm going to make it slightly below the surface. That way when I draw it out, in theory it should work. Uh oh, looks like it drew it buried it way too much. Just slightly under the surface then. That's still too much. It's burying it far more than I want. It's gotta find that right brush depth that'll hide those holes. Alright, that does the trick. You can see all those holes are hidden now in the back end. No, no they're not. You can still see them a little bit deeper. You gotta make it somewhat large for you to be able to see them. Super subtle. Alright, so that works pretty well. However, if I think about it, it presents a new challenge, which is that once I draw it out, to the scale I want to draw it out, and try to cut the edges and try to uh, have it be this big, now I have to wrap it around my mesh. Which isn't too hard probably use a deformer to do that but it seems like an unnecessary amount of effort for something we've already got figured out let's see yeah because now I'd have to wrap it around this way using a bend deformer of some sort which I haven't experimented too much with the deformers just yet what about you guys do you like the deformers in the new ZBrush I think they just added it in the previous iteration What I like about this is the control, because I can come in and very clearly position this the way I want. So I can work with it as a separate element before I eventually decide to merge it. Look at it from the top. And we can go into the gizmo now, and under that settings tab, that's where the deformers are. So the bend curve is probably what we need. Fresh crashes during this. Alright, but this is interesting. Rhythm Studio says brush modifier projection to 100. Let's try that. Because I've never actually tried the brush modifier projection setting. So I'm going to undo a bit rather than try to bend it into place. Let's see, when I do the IMM brush modifiers. projection strength to 100. So in theory that would project it across the surface that we've got here.
just And it crashed. Looks like uh, the projection thing is pretty uh, processor intensive. Okay, gonna open up ZBrush again. I've got a few ways I think I can mitigate that, probably by decimating my logo mesh uh, so it's much less, much fewer polys. Uh, that would help. Uh, just trying to play with different projection settings, but I don't need to figure that out over a stream because that will just delay the inevitable, which is trying to wrap this project. So I'm going to open up Ryan Winch's Logan character, and we'll just go with the previous iteration of the logo we did and move forward. No, thank you for the suggestion, Rathon. I'll definitely have to work on that and try to make it work perfect. We got Sika Von Medicus here. What's up, Sika? Thanks for joining my stream. It's all good, Rathan, no worries. Trying things is what streaming is all about for me. All right, I'm gonna anti-alias this so we can see it a bit better. And we should have the previous base where we had it drawn out. So that's looking like it should work and print pretty well. I'll do a little bit of cleanup on there, but I think that should work well. And I want to add the little Ryan Winch logo tab right there as well. So by Ryan Winch. So I don't think I have the buy, but I have Ryan Winch, so I can add that. Quickly go over into Photoshop, create a new layer. And I will cut the end off. Whoa. Way too big. Let's crop it. And let's turn it just black and white. That way when I save it, no layers. Now it should work as a perfect clean alpha. ZBrush works really well just in the black to white space. It has trouble with different grays. Which is interesting, different 3D software have different preferences. Maya always liked that 50% gray. All right, I'm gonna go back to Space Program logo, get in that RM Winch one. Hmm, wonder why it doesn't show up. Oh, there it is. All right, so I'm gonna flip horizontal. I'm going to make it into an alpha. Turn the texture off, drag rectangle on. And I think I wanna do Z sub, let's try that. Once more. I think we should do some masking, but first let's just draw it out. Right, not bad. Draws out pretty well. Buries itself nicely. A bit too deep. Adjust the Z intensity from 25 down to 20. I think I've got that pretty much in line with this concept. Let's see. Yeah, he kind of had it just above the edge right there. 
you know, an easy way for me to be able to get it exactly the way I want is to adjust the mask in Photoshop so that this logo is a bit higher than center point. Save it again. Ah, this layers. Okay. Okay, got that there, and let's try again. Nope, that's gotta import it first. Import. Where's RM which one? Okay, texture. There it is. I'm going to flip horizontal. I'm going to make it an alpha. And then try again. All right, that's working. Gonna need to kill the focal shift and try again. All right, always overdo it. This one's way too high now. I didn't need it that much off the ground. Just slightly. Save that out again, and that should do the trick. This is why 3D artists accumulate so many files so quickly. We keep trying different iterations of textures, different iterations of 3D for files, models and scenes. Okay. That one, and there it is. Flip horizontal, make alpha, off. All right, perfect. So we try to line it up with this uh, feature we've got drawn in there. All right, that works pretty nice. I'm going to do a little bit of Dynamesh and clean up, and then this should be ready to go. Then we can start merging everything and start getting it ready for our final uh, print. All right, uh, Blans on uh, Twitch is saying, uh, could you have used the 3D text tool in ZBrush? Yep, definitely. There's a hundred different ways to do anything in ZBrush, like I said. I was just trying to show a way that I'm the most comfortable with and doing it fast for streaming. But I have to experiment more with this text tool you speak of. Put it on my nose to look that up. ZBrush these days seems to add more features than I can keep up with. All right, so Dynamesh is done now. And again, I'm gonna just go over it with a quick smooth tap. And let's fix some of these funky edges we've got from the previous basic sculpting. I'm gonna come in here with my damp standard tool. Refine some of these. You may be able to tell hard surface sculpting is not my forte. Shocking. Let's see. I'm going to try to adjust the brush size here. Maybe actually select a different alpha to get that hard, thick line. Perfect. Maybe a bit stronger, even. And increase the lazy radius. Not that much. All right, I just need to basically get it to go into here where the rocks start. Let's see if 
there's any other edges here that I should pull in. One more here. To me, ZBrush does provides a really fun sculpting experience. So I tried to do everything sculpturally, especially coming from like you know standard classic Maya background. It's really nice to be able to just try to do everything via sculpt. However, it leaves some things pretty uh, unpolished for personal projects. You gotta figure out better ways of doing everything. But I encourage you guys to experiment and try, because that's how you learn, even if it's not perfect. Don't let perfection stand in the way of actually making things. Now, Damn Standard does this really weird pinching movement. I'm going to try over here, so I might try something different. Let's try just the standard brush. Or you know what? Orb Cracks. Let's try that. Orb Cracks brush. Yeah, that works a lot better. A lot of industry professionals I've met is really fun discussions because we've talked about what brushes we use and things like that. And oftentimes, it's just like four brushes. Like the clay, the clay buildup, the damp standard, and Move. Move is probably the most used brush by all artists. This is going over these various areas, hitting them with like H polish, hitting them with damp standard, smooth. Let's try to maybe close these loops as well. See if that works. See what it looks like from the front. Lower my intensity. Let's come in and sculpt a little. So what I'm doing this technique here is to just go inflate a little bit with the clay buildup brush and then come in with the trim adaptive to clean up, line it up with the outer surface. Very quick way to get things lined up. I'm trying to get in these cracks and clean them up with some damn standarding or orbs cracks. This is what it boils down to at the end of the day, it's just sculpting. Sculpting as well as you can. And the hard part of streaming while doing it is that everyone sees all the bad stuff. There's a lot of bad stuff until you get to the good stuff.
Once that dyna mesh again, let's just start cleaning this up pretty nicely. All right, so Retom Studios is saying, 3D text and vector shapes is pretty handy for importing vector images. Do you use pinch at all? Yeah, all the time. <laughs> all right, we got Taran Singh in the house. What's up, Taran? All right, it's 921. Let's try to zoom out a bit. Take a look at this thing as a whole. Turn off solo mode. We've got everything in the scene. Those rocks hide those edges pretty well. Almost. Let's see, some of the rocks don't go deep enough. So these. That one works fine, that one works okay. Those need to go a bit deeper. I'm liking how it's looking, and I know it's going to be pretty nice and 3D printable, just based on how we've sculpted it, all in one go. So let's start preparing this mesh for 3D print now. What I'm going to do is merge visible, and it should basically create a new subtool and append that on. Now, it's not going to append that on, we'll have to append that on. Alright, uh, Ibrahim Bhagat52 is asking, how do you get the poly counter on the main screen uh, like I have? So my entire UI is custom. So I've designed all of this custom UI. So I've got some of my depth brush stuff over here. I've got that stuff up top. I even have some stuff at the bottom, which you guys don't really get to see based on this projection oftentimes. So you can see all of those tools I've got at the bottom. Those are my brushes down here. And you know, 3D print related stuff. So you can customize all of your UI by going to preferences um, and I think it's in custom UI and config so you can basically enable customize control shift to drag buttons wherever you want them in your UI and then click on preferences store config and save that UI and that'll basically keep your UI and bring it up every time you uh, load the scene Yeah, so Ibrahim Bhagat, uh, using a laptop 15 inches, it shouldn't matter what kind of uh, laptop or screen you're using. Uh, the main thing is to just uh, customize the UI, save that UI, and store the config. And just YouTube a video on how to uh, customize UI and ZBrush, and it'll come up for sure. All right, so there's my Merge Space Pilgrim character, 26.2 million polys. So I'm going to append him onto my scene with everything in it. Let's also not forget about his buds. We've got Quark, the little robot that's hanging out there. And he's already been decimated and hollowed and ready for 3D printing. I can show you that. The little robot bud. If we hide half of them, you can see how this mesh has been hollowed. And there's some holes right there to ventilate out any excess resin in there. Same thing with the base. Actually, I don't think I hollowed the base because I wanted it to be uh, pretty heavy 
to keep the weight of that quark balanced. Might end up shrinking all of it in general. But let's hide quark for now. Uh oh, where'd he go? Base there. I'll basically want to dynamesh him and get him hollowed and exported out for print. So I'm going to do that right now. Let's go to Geometry Dynamesh and I don't know what resolution will be the best, so let's try just really low first. There's a lot of pieces in this, so it might chug. Alright, so we know the Dynamesh can work on this mesh, but 8 is way too low of a resolution, or 16. So now let's try 500. This is how I just go about figuring it out usually. And when there's this many polyframes, it can be a bit difficult for Dynamesh to calculate, so I'm going to press Ctrl W to unify all those polygroups. And then Dynamesh at 500 resolution. All right, looks like that worked. Let's see, it's got it up to 3.5 million polys. And if we zoom in, a bit of our detail is getting muddy and rastered. And if we go back in history, we can check how it looked before and after. So 500 resolution, though it gives us 3 million polys, which is a lot already, it's not enough resolution. So I'm going to undo again, and let's try at a thousand. I think that should do the trick for us. Hopefully it won't crash us. Make it a bit small and seen as well, so it's not thinking too hard about the presentation to us. And Dynamesh. All right, uh, Ibrahim Bugger 52 on Twitch is asking, <clears throat> I made this face of a woman, and it looks just like the reference from left, but when I see it from front, it starts to look like a bony man. I don't know what to do. Okay, um, so I can't, you know, give you feedback without really seeing the image. If you want to email me, aimanakhtar at gmail.com, I'd be happy to give you some feedback. Um, however, um, if you're having a problem with a face looking feminine from the side but too masculine from the front there's a few things you can look at um, one is the chin and the jaw uh, make sure that the jaw is not too square if you round it out just curve it a little bit 
uh, that's going to look a lot more feminine from the front. Uh, another thing is the um, the lines right here. If you've got wrinkle lines, um, I don't know what these are, the actual proper terminology for these are. Nasolabial folds, I think they're called. Right here between the cheeks and the lower mouth. If you emphasize those a lot, then your model is going to start looking more masculine and older. So basically just smooth those out. Uh, and those two things should help you make your model look a lot more feminine. All right, so at 1,000 resolution, we get all sorts of jankiness. This can happen in ZBrush when your resolution, it just can't keep up. It can't calculate all that. So let's try 800 resolution and see if that works. All right, it's thinking. Good, good. All right, 800 resolution is still giving us too much jankiness, which is a shame. Let's try 700. And it might just be a case of ZBrush running out of memory with too much undo history. So maybe if I close it and open it up again, it'll work. <coughs> but seeing as the scale of this thing is only going to be about like four inches tall, I'm not too freaked out about losing resolution. Uh, it's going to come out good still at that resolution. Uh, Raytown Studios is asking how much does the blur being set to 2 affect the Dynamesh? So blur will basically try to soften that Dynamesh a little bit uh, and you're right basically if I have it set really high it'll blur away all the details. Yeah, I think it's not going to do anything for me because there's just not any uh, memory left in ZBrush right now because we've had it open a while and we were working um, despite having the crash. So I'm going to try a couple things. I'm going to try to save this model just on its own so we have no other subtools in the scene. Let's see. Dyna test. Let me close out of ZBrush and open it up again, and then we'll try again the same test on this new newly saved model without any subtools in the scene. Got ZBrush loaded up again. I'm gonna scroll down and find that Dyna test folder or Dyna test Z tool. Open that up. Draw that out. So we're now we have a clean scene. We'll press Control W to unify all the poly groups. We'll make sure everything is MRGB color fill object, so that everything is the same material. Make it pretty tiny in our scene. We're not doing any anti-aliasing. Rendering is set to fast or preview. Um, let's go ahead now and adjust. We'll kill the blur. Crank this up to 800. And click Dynamesh.
All right. And nope. Okay, so even the freshly clean new scene is giving us too much trouble uh, with that much resolution. So I think 600 might be our max. Let's see. It's been interesting for me over the past, let's see, let me turn this audio down. It's been interesting for me for the past four months because I've been working on this project since September, uh, just trying to show you guys how I go through a project from start to finish, trying to work primarily only during stream time. Um, so that's, you know, two hours or so per week for four months uh, on the same project. And it's been very interesting to see it develop and the challenges of trying to stream something like this, which I would usually try to finish within a week or two, uh, over the course of four months. And of course, you guys seeing all the headache and hassle of the dumb stuff that happens, like trying to re mesh over and over, re-export textures, meshes over and over, uh, trying to figure out just the best way of doing it. And 3D artists don't normally show all of that process. We like to show the glitzy, glamorous, just the fun sculpting part, and ha, here's the finished, rendered, beautiful thing. But with 3D printing, since it's an engineering output, since it's a bit harder to get to the finished product, I wanted to show you the struggle, all of the troubleshooting, all of the headaches. Um, here we go. So it works at 500 uh, resolution, but pretty much nothing above that. At 3 million is our cap which I guess it's a bit janky, but let's see what it looks like once we're done with it. Uh, I'm going to have to uh, hollow it out anyway, so it's going to get uh, even more heavy. So I think I'll just run with it at this resolution. Control W to unify the group. I'm going to go to deformation and do a quick little smooth. Just tap smooth out 100 a few times. We'll lose a bit more details, but it'll get rid of any kind of the rasterization and jankiness. Looks like most of it's working pretty nice and clean. Try to come in and adjust this strap. I just saw something. Good old move brush to the rescue. All right. This is doing a quick all the way around, making sure it looks good. That it does. And I can even come in here now. And now that it's all one mesh piece, smooth out some of those areas that don't need to have their own thing. You can get under there and inflate some of these areas as well. Make sure we don't have any unnecessary stuff happening. Unnecessary cavities. There's going to be a few. But I think that should be fine. The Form Labs Form 2 that we're going to print this on is pretty smart about parsing out a lot of the negative stuff. And we're going to hide half the mesh. And let's check it out what's going on on the inside. So we'll go to Display Properties, Double. And so we've got a few different cavities in here. We want to probably go in and fill those up. Just so there's no randomness that comes up. We'll check that I do. The inverse check. Inflate that, inflate that. And you can see what it happens when I do inflate it from the outside versus the inside. So I'm going to try to inflate it from the outside. Inward this. 
Again, display properties double, just to check. Weird stuff happening there. What's going on there? Uh, we've got a little bit of meshing. And that's what it looks like when you get meshing. Intersecting surfaces. From the inside, it'll look like a big gate. The hair there, too, in the back. I'm going to inflate that. All that. Cool. The rocks at the bottom, there's a bunch of weird stuff happening in the bottom of the rocks. This is my standard, in, uh, standard check before I go to print. I always hide part of the mesh and do a little inflate pass. Try to make sure I get rid of all these janky bits. Because when I dyna mesh, all those janky bits will be gone. Because we don't want any unnecessary cavities and this, all this negative space. A little bit is fine, but just not too much. Like you see in this, it looks like there's whole caverns being formed under there, which I don't want. So I'm trying to hide and inflate parts of my mesh. And I'm not going over the whole chunk of it. I'm only trying to close off the entry passageways. Because once I do that, the rest of it should automatically follow. When I down the mesh, it'll get deleted. All right, let's see what happens when we do Dynamesh it now. Again, probably at the 500 resolution we left it at. All right, so A. Nuna is saying, why don't you not just uh, make a lower Dynamesh and subdivide it and project all the detail back? It's a great idea. I've done that before as well. And you could decimate the Dynamesh. Yeah, I would decimate the Dynamesh after. The basic workflow I'm showing you guys is how I go through the model for preparing to 3D print versus the fun sculpting part, you know, blocking out the base shapes, getting into detailing. And then comes the part preparing it to print. Uh, for that transition, you have to first uh, do the Dynamesh and figure out the best resolution over and over. Or, you know, like you said, project and try that. And then you have to go in and hollow it and then decimate it. So that's the workflow that I recommend. All right, now that I've dynameshed again, we take a look. Now you can see because of my inflating, a lot of those islands that were there are gone. There's still a few there, uh, and I can come in and remove those. The more I inflate, the more these rocks will start to fill up. So I could actually do it just from the top. Let's try to fill in these negative spaces between the rocks and that is going to have the same effect as what I was doing below it's going to hide those cavities and delete them so inflate is really good for this kind of thing you can't get them all from the top that's why you gotta get in there and try to get them from inside Usually this kind of thing will come up if you have rocks, but it'll also come up if you have hair um, or different cloth pieces or feathers or any kind of extrusion, extruding parts. So then you dynamesh and then it fills those in. Let's take a look again. And now you can see even fewer islands in there. All of that's getting taken care of. Still some junk over here, so I'm going to go in from the bottom, inflate that here. And that's just sort of the last of it. All right, so let's see. GR33N 
Demand says, I love sculpting. The dynameshing and measuring afterward to get the model 3D print ready is a pain. No, totally. You're right. It's uh, just like any other output. There's the fun part, and then there's the technical part. It's the same when I was rendering a, a lot back in the day. When you're not 3D printing and your output is just Mental Ray or Arnold or whatever, there's still a technical process. There's always a little bit of pain. But then you get the final beautiful result. All right, so Peter Robbie Art is saying, uh, can you suggest a good uh, printer for first time? OK, so what I recommend, and I've done this before, is to just look up, I believe it's called 3D Hubs Printer Guide, 2018 Best 3D Printer Guide by 3D Hubs, and they do a pretty good uh, yearly, um, not, vo not vote based, but I guess aggregated uh, collection of printers. So you can look up the prosumer level, which is I guess what I am, a workhorse, a budget printer, and I'd recommend starting with the budget printer. Something like these Rostock Max, you know, 999, the CR10 is a pretty famous one these days, uh, about 500 bucks or even less you can get it on Amazon. Uh, and it's a self-assemble FDM printer, but it'll get you the hang hang of you know making physical objects from your digital models, and then from there you can try to upgrade to something like a Ultimaker or a Formlabs Form Two or Raise 3D. Um, those are the ones that I think will give the best output, but they're a lot more pricey as well. So if you're just starting out, go with something like a CR10. Oh, there's a few printers on Kickstarter right now, too, a few SLA printers. Uh, the problem with those is it's just not guaranteed that you're going to get, uh, get it or even get it within the year. All right, so this is looking good. The only thing I'm worried about is this little cavity here between the strap and the shirt. So I want to try to fill that in. One easy way to fill it in, which I found I like, is to use my IMM primitives. Not the half ones, just the full ones. Oh, these are the full ones. And insert a sphere in there. Once you've got that sphere in there, it'll automatically turn the alpha on so that you can quickly go in and sculpt it. And just use it as a fill, you know? check it out from that end too make sure it's still looking good that it is drop that selection and dyno mesh and now it'll basically merge that sphere in with the rest of the mesh <coughs> come in smooth it out So there's always a, a certain amount of re-sculpting that happens when you go through this phase, even if you were to project. And this is why I was saying I don't care too much about the details being perfect because of the scale of this print, the output. It's going to be about that big. So I already know, you know, a lot of those really fine details that if I were to present this as render that I would try to nail down, I don't need to because it'll look good at that size. All right, so next step is to hollow it. It's 950. Let's see how long I can get this done in. I'm going to save this out as Logan 16. We don't need everything else in there right now. I'm going to go down to my insert mesh primitives switch to my cylinder I like to lower my brush depth a little bit which let me hide my OBS window to the side lower that down and hold alt as I drag down and that's going to drag out a inverted cylinder I'm going to drop the mass selection and then I'm going to go to geometry dynamesh and create shell 
Now thickness of four is usually a bit too thin, uh, so I like to set mine pretty high, like seven or eight. And then, yeah, it's going to do it based on the Dynamesh resolution you're at. Um, 500 resolution was the max I was allowed to go in this scene uh, before it started crashing. So I'm going to go ahead and save this before I Dynamesh. And then now go ahead Dynamesh. Uh, not Dynamesh, I'm going to create shell. It's not doing anything right now. Oh, because Dynamesh was off. So in order for this to work properly, you need to have Dynamesh on and then do the insert mesh. Draw, drop, and then create shell. This should hollow it out. <laughs> GR33 and Demand is saying, oh man, look at all those duplicate save files. Absolutely, you got to version up. You got to version up every time you work. So these are all of the different uh, files just for this project. So if I take a look at the properties, so this project alone is 10 gigs for me now. And that's pretty standard working for most of these uh, projects. They get to be about like 10 gigs each, uh, even if it's like just one sculpt. So you need a good hard drive. All right, Rithan is saying, any advice for exaggerating faces for printing at 28 to 32 millimeter miniature scale? Oh yeah, I mean, I was working in miniatures for the past year. Um, you have to really pronounce the brows. Um, the eyes, don't even worry about the detail, will not show up at that miniature scale. Pronounce the brows, the cheek lines, uh, the jaw line, uh, you know, just jut it out further than you think. Um, things like that, you know, really obvious stuff. All right, Lilthorne saying, any reason you prefer using Dynamesh over live Booleans for your prep? Uh, no, no reason. I mean, Dynamesh is just my preference because I was doing it before live Booleans became a thing. Um, I do use live Booleans for slicing and keying when I need to. Uh, this mesh, I already did a print test earlier at miniature scale where I didn't need to do any of the slicing and keying. It prints as a solid piece. Let me bring that out for you guys. All right, so it's still dynameshing, but I can, in the meanwhile, make this window a lot bigger and show you this little mini test I did. So this is the same character, but this is basically just, you know, the second week of sculpting or maybe the third week. Uh, no, I think the second week. Um, we just basically, no, this is the third week because the Brack Pack is a bit more defined. But I did this little print test. He kind of printed him like this way, facing a bit upwards. And then that way I knew that I'll be able to print at large scale without slicing and keying. So hopefully it'll still work. I always recommend doing a little mini test before you go to the large scale testing. It saves your material when you, you know, fail and you're like, why? Alright, so the hollowing is complete. And at 8 hollowing, let's see what it looks like on the inside. Whoa. Uh -oh. All right. So, still a pretty conservative hollowing. You can see that thickness is not that thin as if we had left it at four. So, this should work pretty well for us. Uh, but there's a lot of detail going on on the inside, which is really janky. Uh, a lot of this rasterized stuff uh, that the form labs, when you try to take it into preform, it'll try to create supports for a bunch of it which negates the whole point of hollowing because it'll just fill up the whole thing with supports. So one thing I like to do once I've got my hollow is to go in well, I'm going to mask the edges and what I'm going to do then is group masks. So Right now the poly frame is all one piece, but I'm going to try to go to poly groups, group mast, and that'll group just that area. You can try it again so you can see the clear differences. 
and then I can control shift click on this oh, on the poly and it'll hide that group. Next I'm going to click on auto groups and that's going to group the inside and outside separately because that mass bit is hidden. Reshow that mass bit and then now I can click on just the inside and I should be able to see just the inside. So here it is, that's my inside hollowing. Really creepy looking. <laughs> But it gets the point across, it's, it's the hollowed part. So now there's a bunch of things I can do. Um, first thing I want to do is just smooth everything. So I'm going to go holding shift, just smooth the heck out of it all. Because I don't need any of that detail on the inside. Alright, now the next bit is to delete any of the parts that I don't want to get hollowed. So I'm pretty sure I don't want to hollow these straps and I don't need to hollow these like little floating bits right there. So what I can do is try to hide everything that I like and the stuff that I don't like, just leave it visible. So I'm going to go to my select tool, just hide everything that looks good. It's not a particularly advanced technique, but it's something to think about when you're getting ready to print. That area should be okay, but just in case, I want to toss it. And the legs, I think all of that should be okay. That makes me worry, because that means there's a lot of negative space there. Yeah, but I think all of that should be okay. I'm going to hide just that. Uh oh, don't want to do that. Undo. The tubes will be thin enough as it is, so I don't want any negative space there unnecessarily. Same with this little backpack chin strap area. I'm going to invert that selection now so that area that was visible is going to be deleted when I go to Geometry, Modify Topology, Delete Hidden. And so that should have deleted the hidden parts and now when I Dynamesh it should resolve them. So the tubes now will be perfectly uh, not hollow. <coughs> Rithon Studio is saying, could you use Sculptress to smooth destroy the bits you want to get rid of? Um, depends, really. I mean, like, I always think that it's better to do this slightly manual process to finish it off. Because uh, then you're aware and checking things rather than trying to automate it. Alright, so there we go. There's our hollowed mesh. The inside is not detailed. It's nice and smooth. Uh, even, like, the tubes. We can double-check those. 
should not be hollowed. Yep, the tubes are not hollowed, as we can see. So yeah, we're ready to get this decimated and send it to print. I'm going to go to Z plugin, decimation raster, pre-process current, and then we'll export it out and open it up in preform and get it ready. I should be able to do this in the next 15 or so minutes, so I'll go a little bit over stream time to wrap it. And then I'll set up a quark to print later off stream, and next week when you guys tune in to my January 7th stream, I should be able to show you the finished print. <clears throat> In the meanwhile, while that's done meshing, let's see here. I'm going to open up something that I just recently was thinking about, which is kind of my top nine uh, of 2018. Uh, 28, the top nine projects or best nine projects that I feel like, you know, I accomplished over this past year. Let me actually, it's hard to see the bottom ones with this uh, screen or, or resolution orientation. So while this is dynameshing, I'll just pull it out. Come on now, why is it not letting me? Yeah, there we go. There we go. Okay, so I guess these are the projects that I'm the most proud of over this past year and just kind of representing what I've been about in 2018. Uh, a lot of 2018 at this bottom center, you can see I was working at uh, Hero Forge working on these miniatures for Dungeons and & Dragons and gaming collectibles. And it was a really fun experience working with a small startup team, learning about how they do their organization and how um, they do create this customizer which is very versatile and making models for miniatures that was really fun um, aside from that running my own 3d smiths business on the side with this uh, Lubu ninja you see on the right head bottom right uh, this is where I work with clients to either take their existing models or sculpt brand new stuff for them print them relatively large scale and have them painted for pitching like you know pitching for movies pitching for new uh, IP for games and uh, toys so that's the kind of stuff I do on the side. Seabrush Streaming on the bottom left, Ryan Winch's Logan project here. I threw it on there because it's it was an interesting four-month journey of trying to take a project that I would normally take two weeks on and stretch it out over four months was really interesting for me uh, in streaming this entire process to learn about the streaming process um, as well as just streaming on Zbrush. You know, Zbrush live and uh, the folks at Pixelogic giving me the chance to come and show my process and how I go about sculpting and how I think about things and how I prep stuff. So that was all a really interesting journey for me in 2018. Uh, this middle row is personal projects. Uh, I got to do a few of them this year. I did this whole Aquaman suit for myself, uh, which I don't have right now, but uh, basically trying to mix Aquaman and the Infinity Stones, trying to create a really badass character. Uh, and I'm really happy with how I was able to get the prints uh, of all these scales out of my Raise 3D and 2 Plus stitched onto the shirts and so many people involved in this project. Brett Stanley, the photographer, Jessica Drew, who helped me uh, just kind of do a little bit of training and tips on how to do underwater photo shoots. Uh, my wife, Fa, and uh, her sister, Suryong, who helped me do some stitching. It was a really fun project that pretty much just start to finish wrapped within two months or less. Uh, and you can catch that on the Zebra streams as well. Uh, the Kuma Black Panther mask that I made in January, which ended up blowing up in uh, on Reddit. That was hilarious. Uh, Corgi Black Panther. Um, and then the Scar mask here I did on Zebra stream for Halloween. Not even long. I, I did the whole sculpt within two hours, the one stream, and printed it out. And, you know, next week I was wearing it. And I think that's the kind of projects I want to focus on in 2019. A lot more one-offs, a lot more get from start to finish, print and go, uh, than like taking four months on one stream uh, project. So look forward to more of these. And I've got them hanging up in my room now, up there, which I like. Let's see. If I zoom out. 
the Scar mask right there, and Kuma the Corgi mask, the Black Panther Corgi mask. Going back to this now, I've got uh, Beyond Personal Projects, the big project I worked on this year uh, was my own Fungusaurus toy line. And there's my wife, Fa. Uh, she did all the graphic design, the branding, the UI, the app development uh, UI uh, for this project, and I did the characters. Uh, and then the toy mass production, we actually went through the factory process, uh, going to Hong Kong, driving and uh, taking the train into Shantou, Guangdong province to see 30 people in a factory working on my toys, learning about customs, exporting, importing, uh, all of that process. Uh, and Solomon here at the YouTube space for the Zebra podcast interviewing us about the whole process. Um, and just really interesting to see this project that we've worked on for three years now. We launched it at CTN. We finally started fulfilling our Kickstarter. Um, and then we've sent out almost all the pledges now. Um, great to see this project that started as an idea in my head quickly on a sketch pad. Then I made these ZBrush models, I printed them out using the Form 2 and prototyped them, put them out of designer con, saw that there was interest, so we tried to figure out how to mass produce them, did that, and now we've got 15,000 toys in our warehouse to try to get distribution for. So, really epic journey uh, in 2018 for me. Uh, didn't get to do as much personal work as I wanted, didn't get to do as many projects as I wanted, and I can't show most of the projects I did do professionally, but it was really cool overall 2018 to uh, push as hard as I did to build my own IP, to do some personal projects, and do a lot of client-side stuff and streaming. So overall, I'd say a pretty successful year. And 2019, like I said, I look forward to doing for streaming more of these SCAR kind of projects where they're one-offs. So every stream, I'll try to do a new project. Uh, and I'll see how long I can keep that up. And uh, just keep building more of my fungus source. I think I'll do, I'll finish a whole new line, you know, eight new characters, uh, and try to develop the app. So that's the next uh, goal for 2019, to push for that app and then take it from there. All right, so back to Zebra now. We got up to 6.2 million polys, but it's been Dynamesh now. Everything is unified and... We're ready to decimate it, so I'll go to decimate current. At 20%, that should lower it down to slightly more than a mil. So not bad. We got most of the detail still. I'm going to take it down to 15, see if we lose any detail. And I didn't see much detail lost there. So 931,000 polys, it's still pretty good. So 930,000 polys, less than a million inside and out. And if we hide it, we can see that it's still hollowed as well. So this is a mesh that I'm ready to say is good for 3D printing. My usual thing to do is go to the skin shade with the green and do a color fill object just so I know this thing is 3D printable. I'll save it. And now I can export it to 3D print. Uh, the easiest way to do that is to go to the 3D print hub, go to update size ratios, and I'll set this to, I don't know, let's try about four and a half inch height. Or four and a half inch at the largest axis. Let's try five and see if it works. And I'll just do send to preform. And in theory, you should send it from ZBrush directly into preform. So let's try that. <laughs> I said in theory, and Siri popped up. <laughs> All right. Um, hopefully I wasn't chugging during too much of the time I was just talking about my 2018 uh, top nine um, but I think that happens when you die in a mesh. Hero Forge is dope. Yeah, it's an awesome customizer that team built. They did their own Kickstarter, built a small team around it and then, you know, 10 to 14 people just build this, you know, they're the number one spot to go and get custom miniatures which is pretty cool. 
All right, did I print those masks full color or paint them afterwards? Nope, I <laughs> printed them just uh, standard FDM uh, filament and then painted them afterwards. All right, so here we go. It's going to need to repair it once it brings it into preform. All right, so it's repairing right now. And once that's done, then we'll be ready to start orienting, adding supports, and sending it to the printer. thinking about it you guys can not see it but right at the bottom it says repairing try to maybe shrink it down a bit so you can see that You can see even under a million polys, it takes a while to repair and get the mesh what Preform thinks is print ready. So since I exported inches, I'm going to try to bring it in using inches as well. And let's see what this looks like first. Here we go. So at 5 inches, it fits in the build volume pretty perfectly. You can rotate it upwards a bit because we know that that technique worked before. But then we start getting a bit uh, out of bounds, which is why I had to shrink it down. So I'm going to again go into here and shrink it down. Just so we have enough room for the supports in there. Point size at 60, density at 1. I'm printing in tough resin. So I'm going to switch this from clear to tough. I believe it's V5 that I have at 0.5 resolution, 50 microns. And let's click Generate Selected. Preform is pretty simple to use like that. It's very intuitive. Um, and it's, as far as 3D printing prep software go, um, I found it to be very, very intuitive and easy to pick up. You do have to learn about orientation and supports and adding custom supports. Uh, and that's the kind of stuff I teach in the class as well. GR33N Demand saying, learned a lot today. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, man. You too. I'm glad this is useful for you guys because I don't expect to teach a lot, but it's good for me to just go through my process and share it with you. So hopefully you do get something out of it. So it's thinking about the supports right now and it's going to auto-generate them for me. I get that question a lot. Do I do all the support adding bit by bit? And no, I just let the software handle it and then I go in and tweak and check.
A little more exciting news, I won't be here for the second week of January because uh, Formlabs is actually taking me out to CES, the Consumer Technology Expo in Vegas, where I'll be doing some demos for them. So January 8th through 11th, if you're in Las Vegas, come stop by CES or just come say hi. Uh, or just call me or message me, I'll be in Vegas so we can hang out. Should be interesting, there's a lot of press that attend, there's a lot of... Uh, the latest tech and toys, so I'm excited to get out there and show my fungosaurs and uh, see what happens. All right, still generating supports is going to take a while to think, but basically, uh, I think I'll start wrapping up right now because once it's got the support generated, I'm going to go in and add some custom supports, uh, make sure it's printable. Uh, and then just send it to print. And then next week when you guys tune into the stream, you get to see the finished piece. So let's let this finish up. I'll save. And then we'll start wrapping. All right, here we go. So there's some supports generated. It generated some on the face and straps as well. So I might want to adjust the orientation so there's less of this happening. But overall, pretty good job with the supports. In mostly unobtrusive places, the logo, the front of the face, all of that is unmarked. And the rest of these should clean up pretty easily as well. Not much of supports on the ground as well. I may actually want to increase the density on those. But I'm going to save this out. And next week when you guys tune in, I should have the finished prints ready for you to see. So, save this in Ryan's job. Logan full size print test. One. All right, thanks for helping me troubleshoot the audio. Thanks for sticking around for the entirety of the stream or even catching part of it and hearing me talk about a little bit of my 2019 uh, plans and 2018 accomplishments. Um, you know, seeing this uh, project from start to finish, I'm pretty happy to be wrapping it up now. I'm happy to answer any more.